Good afternoon, and I hope everybody's doing good today. I am back with another true crime tea time. So I wanted to talk about this case that comes from my state of Minnesota. So let me bring you guys back to years ago. One of the big things that we used to do in the state of Minnesota was this huge annual festival called the Taste of Minnesota. And this was just a dope festival. It started in 1983. And unfortunately, it ended in 2016. But this was like a major part of my childhood. This was one of those festivals. It was free to get in because we also have the Minnesota State Fair, um, which is one of the biggest fairs in the Midwest. And you have to pay for your tickets to get in, the foods, the rides. So the Minnesota State Fair can be somewhat expensive. So they decided in 1983 to do the Taste of Minnesota. And this was a free event. So you didn't have to pay for anything. The only thing you paid for was like, you know, food and rides, but it was free to come in there. And this was like the great Minnesota Twin Cities experience. If you guys don't know about the Twin Cities, we have the capital, which is St. Paul. And literally right across the river, less than 15 minutes away is Minneapolis. These are two major metropolitan cities. Depending on if you take the freeway or the side streets, it's no more than 15 minutes away from each other. And that is very rare because in most states you have the capital city and the next major city is anywhere from two to four hours away. So that is why we're called the Twin Cities. Every year um, growing up, we used to go to the Taste of Minnesota. And this is one of those events where literally you would have people from Minneapolis come into St. Paul. A lot of times, unfortunately, a lot of people from St. Paul don't really go to Minneapolis unless they're going out to the clubs. And most people who live in Minneapolis, they do not venture into St. Paul. It's like that in a lot of cities. One thing about the Taste of Minnesota is that it brought everyone together. I remember getting phone calls from my friends and family in Minneapolis, like, oh, we're coming to St. Paul. We're coming to the Taste. Where are you going to be at? Like, it was just so many memories. And there was really no drama. There might be a fight here and there, but it's nothing like today. There was no gunplay. Like, you knew it was a family environment. And this is something that the Twin Cities was putting on for the residents. So people just came to enjoy themselves. And every time you you came, it was like a reunion. You've been out of school since June. So you'd run into your school friends, you'd run into your Minneapolis friends, your St. Paul friends, you'd run into your friends from the suburbs. Like it brought everybody together. I can't tell you how many times I ran into like cousins and, and you know, family members and friends that I have not seen in years at the taste. This taste of Minnesota that I happened to go to, it was me and um, my best friend at the time. We would all used to go deep. So I'm talking about, this was like our chance to shine. We'd have on like the little cute outfits. We were like a bootleg Destiny's Child, okay? So we're all dressed up looking good. You know what I'm saying? Our little clique. So, you know, we're walking through this, you know, taste of Minnesota, you know, talking to guys, getting phone numbers and all that stuff. And so all of a sudden my friend stops and she's talking to this guy and he's really cute. He's mixed, kind of tall. And, you know, they're like just chopping it up. And so, you know, we're all just standing there waiting for them to stop their conversation. And so she ends up bringing him over and she introduces me to him. And, you know, she's like, hey, this is Bobby. Um, we went to junior high together. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, nice to meet you. So we all just kind of stopped and talked to him. And he was really cool, like very down to earth, very handsome. You know what I'm saying? So we finished our conversation with him. And then, you know, we kept walking to go mix and mingle with everybody there. It was thousands of people there that day. So now fast forward to not even a week or so later, my friend calls me frantic and she's like, oh my God, they just found Bobby's torso. And I'm like, what? Who's Bobby? Cause you know, I had totally forgotten about just meeting this young man. It was my first and my last time, unfortunately, meeting him. And she was like the mixed dude that I introduced you to at the state fair, the real cute one. And I was like, are you serious? And she was like, yes, they're talking about he was murdered and, and dismembered. And when I tell you, I damn near dropped the phone when she called me. This was back in July of 2001. And so we were there at the Taste because it's a 4th of July event. So it's a four day event, it goes from the 1st through the 4th. We were there at the Taste. So that is when we ran into Bobby. That was my first time meeting him. And unfortunately my last time meeting him because Bobby would be killed a few days after us running into him. So welcome to True Crime Tea Time. This is the Bobby Holder, Darnell Smith, and Tina Leia story. So haunting, so chilling. Come quick, the tea here is spilling. If you want it, then come to me. Discuss the crimes and the unsolved mysteries. It's True Crime Tea Time.
According to friends and family, Bobby Holder was definitely a ladies man. He was a charmer. He loved flirting with the girls and the girls loved flirting with Bobby just as much. One of his friends even told the media at the time who didn't have a crush on Bobby. Everybody liked Bobby. Bobby was also a young father. He had a baby as a teenager. And so he was working in this nursing home to help take care of his baby's mother and his young son. Him and his mother were really close. They used to talk literally every day, especially being that Bobby was a young father. She played an intricate part in just helping him with the baby as well. So when Bobby's mother, who he was very close to, started calling his phone and Bobby wasn't responding, she felt in her heart of hearts that something was not right. So she ended up calling the police, but at the time, because Bobby was already 20 years old, the police was like, you know what? He's an adult. You know, he's a handsome young man. He's probably, you know, just, you know, kicking it and hanging out on the town and just, you know, wants a break from everybody. So she decided to say, okay, well, fine. Let me fall back a day or two. And, you know, let me not worry myself because after all, Bobby is grown but she still kind of felt it was weird because even the baby's mother hadn't heard anything from Bobby either. And he had a really young son at the time. So why would he not be returning, you know, phone calls, especially if it may be concerning the baby? So a few days later, as Bobby Holder's mother was going through the St. Paul Pioneer Press, there was a kind of like an APB put out in the newspaper. A torso had been found. There was no head, there were no arms, there were no legs, but there was a very distinctive tattoo on the torso. So they took a picture of the torso, or just where the tattoo part was, and they posted it in the newspaper. I remember people talking about this and whispering about it, but I didn't think anything of it. Bobby's mother saw that same picture that many people in the Twin Cities saw around that time, and she recognized that tattoo. And she's like, you know what, that is my son. That's my son's tattoo. I would recognize that tattoo anywhere. So then she caught the St. Paul police again and says, look, my son did not run off. He's not kicking it. That is his tattoo on that torso. That was just the beginning of her nightmare because at this point she had no idea that a gang leader and a homecoming queen would be responsible for the killing and the dismemberment of her own son. Chippewa County in Wisconsin had always prided themselves in being a really safe place. There wasn't a lot of crime in this community. Um, you literally could go to sleep with your doors unlocked and nobody would come into your home. So a local farmer, his name was Elroy Lea, and basically he was cleaning up his land in the summer of 2001 when he stumbled across something unimaginable. Dirt had been loosely piled on his field. He ended up finding a really heavy trash bag and he asked his neighbor, you know, is this your trash bag? Were you trying to dig something on my land? And the neighbor was like, no, I haven't been on your property at all. So at that point, him and the neighbor decided to open up the trash bag. As they shifted through the trash bag, a putrid smell hit their noses and they both almost threw up. And at first they thought maybe it was animal parts or like a dead cat. But after dumping out all the contents in the bag, they realized this was pieces of a human being. Inside the trash bag, they found a human torso with a visible tattoo on it. So at that point, they both were just freaking out. And the two men quickly realized that this pile of dirt was meant to be a shallow grave to bury somebody's body. They were freaking out. They were disgusted by what they found. So they both went inside the home to quickly call the police. So once the deputies got there, they went through the contents of the bag and they discovered that the head was missing and both the victim's legs and arms were also missing as well. The only thing that was in the bag at the time was the torso. So at that point, they transferred the torso to the medical examiner's office where they determined that this was the body of a 20 year old African American or biracial male because they didn't have the head, they didn't have any other parts besides this torso. That is why they took the picture of the tattoo and they put it in all the newspapers around the Twin Cities. The autopsy also revealed that the cause of death was two gunshot wounds. They found two bullet wounds 
in the torso while they were doing the medical examination. It was obvious to the detectives investigating and to the medical examiner that this person was killed in a fit of rage. And even the way his limbs were basically dismembered and sawed off, it was done like just really raggedly and just, you know, the person who was like sawing him apart, you could tell they were pissed. They were just trying to like break the bone and just, you know, they were muscles ripped and tendons ripped. It was really horrible what they were seeing. And then on top of that, there were words that were carved into Bobby's back and it said blood's rule. So these were the three tattoos that they found of Bobby Holder. On the back of his neck was a scorpion tattoo, which was also in the paper. There was an Indian chief on his upper arm and there were also the letters LSP that were tatted onto his chest. So those were three very distinctive tattoos. So as soon as his mother saw these tattoos in the paper, she knew without a doubt that that was her child. The authorities knew from just the way Bobby's body was treated that this person had to be a horrifically violent person. And the fact that they wrote blood's rule on the victim's back was very sadistic. So initially they thought that this might be a gang situation because in the Twin Cities, we do have gangs up here. We have Bloods, Vice Lords, GDs, Crips. We have, you know, all the major gangs here, just like in any major city. But the way Bobby was killed and disposed of, that's not really how gangbangers get down. And especially in the early 2000s, most gang violence was just in the place of a shooting. Usually a drive-by or you run up on your ops, your enemies, you shoot them and you run off. Most gang members are not going to stick around to dispose of the body or to dismember the body because a lot of times when it's a gang hit, they want to send a message to their rivals. They want to send a message to other people. Like if you mess with, you know, whatever gang, uh, this is what will happen to you. So they're not necessarily going to take the body and, and, you know, chop it up and dispose of it if this was really a gang style hit. So they knew something was off with this. And then the fact that the body was found in Chippewa County, Wisconsin, there is not a a lot of gangs in Chippewa County. Like, let's keep it real. You're not really going to find a lot of bloods out there and, you know, Crips. Like, this is not, you know, Compton. This is not St. Paul. This is not, you know, the south side of Minneapolis. This is like literally a small rural, you know, farm community in the middle of Wisconsin. So it didn't make any sense that there'd be bloods out there dismembering, you know, rival gang members. So at that point, they realized that Bobby was from the Twin Cities. So they decided to have the Minnesota Gang Task Force, um, which has been around forever, get involved in this. But even the gang task force was kind of stumped because when they looked into Bobby's background, they realized Bobby was more or less just a pretty boy. He wasn't out here gang banging. He was a young father. He was working in a nursing home. He didn't have any enemies. Nobody was beefing with him. Everybody who ran across Bobby had something really nice to say about him and on top of that he was very handsome so it's like he did not fit the typical profile of a gang member so that really confused the Minnesota gang task force now Elroy did tell the police that the day before um, he found the trash bag he had basically showed his property to a young man and a young woman he had a really funny feeling about them and he even wrote down their license plate number and he just said something wasn't right with this couple. So he gave the license plate number to the police and the police ended up investigating this young couple. However, after questioning this young couple and bringing them down for interrogation, they realized that the couple had nothing to do with it. They might've been strange, they might've been off, but they were simply looking to genuinely buy land and they were not involved in any way, shape or form with the killing or the dismemberment of Bobby Holder. So finally, a whole week after the torso was unearthed and discovered, the police finally got some type of lead. So a woman caught the Chippewa County police super frantic because remember at this point, Bobby Holder's mom had caught the St. Paul police and they were just kind of dismissive and they were saying, well, he's grown, he's probably out of town, he's probably kicking it, doesn't want to be found right now. But when she saw those tattoos in the newspaper, she became frantic and she ran to go call the Chippewa County Police Department and she was saying that this is her son. He's from St. Paul and she wanted to come down and talk to them. So she came all the way to Wisconsin to the medical examiner's office and that is where Bobby Holder's mother saw her son's torso. She was able to positively identify that that was her son. I mean imagine going from calling and talking to your son every day 
to you calling him. He's not returning your call. You have a sinking feeling. You call the police, you know, you call him in as a missing person only to be dismissed. And now not even a week later, you're at a medical examiner's office looking at just the torso of your child. No head, no arms, no legs, just his torso. I could only imagine what his mother was going through. So after talking to Bobby's mother and doing more research on Bobby Holder and finding out that he wasn't in a gang, he wasn't involved in anything nefarious, the police were even more confused because they're like, well, how did this, you know, sweet young man, you know, this young father, this beloved son, how did he end up in the trappings of some cold blooded killer? Because the person who did this to him, they had to be evil. There was no other way to describe it. So now this is where it gets crazy. So a few days later, the police department got another phone call from a man who was very anxious to talk to them. And he did not want to talk to them over the phone. He wanted to come down and speak to the police in person because he had a story to tell. So the police finally told him yes, and they decided to meet with him at a park in St. Paul. And the young man that they met with, his name was Ramon Smith. So Ramon said that he had saw Bobby Holder's story plastered all over the news. He saw it on television. He saw the tattoos in the newspaper. And he felt that it was only right that he came forward. And he basically told them everything that he knew. And it really hurt him to come out and basically tell the police this because he was very much tied to the people that he knew were involved. But basically, Ramon Smith was the brother of Darnell Smith and Shaka Smith. And he felt like both of his brothers had something to do with the murder of Bobby Holder. At that time, Ramon was extremely nervous. He expressed his own worries for his own safety and felt like if his brothers knew that he was talking to the police, that he would for sure be killed. So the whole time that they're interviewing at the park, he's looking behind his shoulders. He's looking behind him. Basically, his head is on a 360 swivel, okay? Because he knows his brother is cold-blooded. He knows his brother is a manipulator and a killer. And he doesn't want his brother to find out in any way, shape, or form that he's talking to the police because he's extremely scared of Darnell Smith. Now, what was interesting is that the St. Paul police were already on Shaka Smith's trail. At the time, they could not find Bobby Holder's cell phone. So as they're going through their records, they're learning that Shaka Smith has Bobby's cell phone and he's making phone calls from Bobby's phone, which is weird because Bobby's currently missing, yet there's phone calls being made on his cell phone. Now, on top of that, Bobby's car was eventually located and found. And what was very interesting about them finding Bobby's car is the fact that Shaka Smith's fingerprints were in Bobby's car. Now, at this time, the police were familiar with Darnell Smith, but they hadn't tied him to anything with Bobby until Ramon Smith came forward. Now, what they knew of Darnell Smith is that Darnell was a very, very, very violent individual. Like Bobby, Darnell also grew up in St. Paul, but his childhood was very chaotic. His friends even reported that Darnell Smith's father was very abusive. He was very hot tempered and he took out a lot of his frustrations on his son. And so it really affected Darnell in the long run. Everyone around Darnell could see visible signs of abuse, but nobody ever caught the police. Nobody ever caught CPS. And so Darnell stayed in that really abusive situation with his father. Now, a lot of people said that back in the day when Darnell was growing up, he was actually a really good kid. He was very outgoing. Um, he played sports. Um, he was very friendly. And then on top of that, he was very flirtatious. Like Darnell Smith is a very handsome man he had a nice body on him and so you know a lot of people really gravitated towards Darnell and they really liked him you know like in junior high and then somewhere around high school as he grew older he became a lot more colder. Part of that is because he became more withdrawn. He basically stopped being friends with a lot of his original friends that he played sports with and that he did things with and he became more enamored with the gang life. He became very involved in gang life. He went from being very popular to being feared and loving it. And around eighth grade, he decided to join the GDs. So he became a gangster disciple. And all he did basically from eighth grade onward was gang bang. And because he was just so big, he worked on his physique. He soon went up in the ranks and he was his own little GD gang leader in a set in St. Paul. 
1993, he was arrested for um, illegal possession of a firearm. And so that's how he first got into the criminal justice system because he was doing a lot of stuff for the gangs. So he started building not only a rap sheet for himself, but also a lot of street cred as well, all through St. Paul. So eventually Darnell dropped out of high school. And so he was just doing his gang leading thing. He was involved in a lot of petty crimes, you know, for years. And then in his mid twenties, he did a very unimaginable crime. He was arrested and convicted for raping a 12 year old girl. This is a grown man who's a leader of a notorious gang in the Twin Cities, and he's out here raping children. So at that point he was found guilty and he was sent to a Minnesota maximum security correctional facility. And he spent about five Five years in that correctional facility and he was released in 2001. Now after the police were digging into Darnell Smith's past, they kept running across the name Tina Lea and even Ramon had spoke her name while they were interviewing him. So the police started doing more investigation on who Tina Lea was and what they uncovered about Tina Lea was really chilling. So after the police unraveled a lot of Darnell's past, they discovered he had a girlfriend whose name was Tina Lea. Now, the interesting thing about Tina Lea is that she worked at the Stillwater Prison, which was an all-male correctional facility. And she was one of the few females that worked there. And she had recently been fired a few months before this for having a full-fledged relationship with Darnell. Now, Tina's situation is a tale that's old as time. Good girl falls in love with the bad boy because, you know, he provides her with excitement and, you know, something different from her regular day-to-day -day monotony. But she got so swept up into not only liking Darnell, but willing to do anything for Darnell. Now, the whole good girl, bad boy situation, it's all good, it's fun, it's flirty, it's exciting, until that damn bad boy turns on you. And that's exactly what Darnell did to Tina. So as investigators dug into Tina's life, they found two very important links. One, she was tied to Darnell Smith, but the other important link is that Elroy Leia was Tina Leia's father. She literally buried Bobby Holder's body parts on her own father's farm. Now, the thing that really confused investigators is how Tina, this beautiful young girl, got connected with this thug-ass dude, Darnell. They could not figure out the connection for the life of them until they dug into her work history and they realized that she worked at the Minnesota Stillwater Correctional Facility. Now, according to the family, her father did not approve of her relationship with Darnell. He was not here for it at all. He felt like his daughter could do a lot better. After all, she was voted homecoming queen in high school. So how do you go from homecoming queen to shacking up with one of your former prison inmates? Her father and his family did not understand her logic whatsoever. She's always been a straight-laced girl. She'd never been in trouble. And so when her family members tried to talk to her, she felt like they were just jealous. They didn't want to see her happy. But they knew that there was something wrong with Darnell and that he was becoming a bad influence on their daughter. So at that point, when they seen that Tina was not going to leave Darnell alone, they backed up off of Tina because they figured, you know what? She's grown. She's going to date who she wants to date. But we don't have to condone it. Tina Leia grew up in Holcomb, Wisconsin, and she quickly showed signs of a bright future. In the small town that she lived in, she attended Holcomb High School, and it was in that high school that she was voted homecoming queen. She excelled in sports. She excelled in academics. She regularly had her name in the school newspaper. People liked her, and people had a lot of really positive things to say about Tina. So no one could have suspected that this former basketball player, this star volleyball player, and this homecoming queen would ever be wrapped up in this type of hideous situation. Her friends and family recalled her being an all-American girl um, with good values. She graduated high school in 1993, and she quickly enrolled at the University of Minnesota. There she majored in American Indian Studies and Criminology. After she graduated with her degree in 1998, she decided to further her criminal education by taking a job as a guard at the Stillwater Correctional Facility. She was doing really good. She was excelling in her job. She was getting rewards. She was getting accolades for being such a hard worker. And then all of a sudden, she caught the eye of this inmate who had all the swag in the world and who basically, you know, lured her into his web. 
there was literally no female interaction at this prison. Most of these guards were men. She was one of the few women that was willing to take on this job because it's not easy working at a jail or a prison, especially around male inmates. Darnell took a real liking to her and kind of felt like, you know what, she has to she has to be tough to endure something like this, to endure all these guys coming at her and disrespecting her. It was something about Tina that really attracted Darnell to her. So he just decided to start spitting game at Tina and Tina was all for it. She was working in the unit that I was living in in A East and Stillwater. She was at the front door sitting at the desk and she uh, saw me, I saw her and I approached her, spoke to her a few times and one thing led to another and I asked her if uh, she would be my woman and she said yeah. Now, like I said before, Darnell was definitely no stranger to manipulation, and Darnell had the gift of gab, and he just had one of those personalities. He's definitely an alpha male, and he's handsome. He's not an ugly guy. He kept his body up, and he knew how to turn on the charm. You know what I'm saying? Even though he had a dark, devious side, he also had like a charming ladies' man type side as well. And that is the side that he was showing Tina the whole time that they were at Stillwater together, and Tina fell head over heels for Darnell. And the thing that's really disturbing about this is that Tina knew why Darnell was there. It's not like she didn't have access to his case file. He was in prison for raping a 12 year old girl. And Tina didn't care about this. She just saw lust and, you know, she fell in love and they soon started sleeping together, which is insane. This man is in prison for raping, but he's literally sleeping with a guard. He's having his cake and eating it too. The two would spend hours talking to each other on the yard, in the prison chow hall. They'd be flirting with each other. They really grew close and it started making people uncomfortable. And soon there were lots of whispers around the prison, some from, you know, male haters, you know, other prisoners who felt like, you know, hold up, why is she spending all this time with Darnell? Why is she in his cell? They just seemed like they're a couple. It was something about their vibe. And so a lot of the inmates started complaining or quote unquote hating, as Darnell would say it, on him and you know they started making kind of a ruckus like something is not right with their relationship and soon she was being investigated so tina was head over heels for darnell she was sneaking him all types of contraband you know everything from drugs to pills weed all types of stuff but most importantly, she got so infatuated with him that she started sending him nudes of herself. And she would sneak these pictures into Darnell's cell. This is just really crazy that she got that infatuated that she was willing to put her job at risk. Well, if you guys know anything about prison from watching prison lockup shows, um, they tend to do prison shakedowns. Like, I don't know, every now and then they're random searches. You know, they're not announced because they don't want the prisoners to be able to hide anything. And so one night Night, they decide to do a shakedown because they have been hearing whispers about Tina and Darnell and things like that. So they wanted to do a shakedown to see what they could find. And Darnell was not quick enough. He was unable to hide the pictures. And so the deputies go into his jail cell. And after just tearing up his entire jail cell, they found the nudes of Tina. And at first they didn't think it was Tina because, you know, they're used to seeing Tina you know, just dressed in her guard uniform. So it took them looking at the picture for a while, like, oh my gosh, this is Tina. This is one of our guards. Why do you have naked pictures of one of our guards? So that is how the secret came out. Once they found the naked pictures of Tina, who was a guard at Stillwater in Darnell's prison cell, at that point, Tina was fired on the spot. And the crazy thing is once her superiors called her in to fire her and let her know that they were extremely disappointed in her behavior and they couldn't believe that she was carrying on a relationship with not only an inmate, but a child rapist. You know, they were really disappointed in her. And they said like Tina's attitude was very flippant. She didn't care. You know, they tried to discipline her. They wanted to get her counseling. She didn't want any of that. She did not care. She had her man. She was happy to find her man. And she felt like, you know what, at the end of the day, people can change. You know, he might have raped one time, but that was just a one-time thing. He would never do anything to hurt her because he truly cared and loved her, you know, because he was running all this game on her. That's what she thought. But that wasn't the truth at all. And she was going to find that out very soon. So the crazy thing is after she was fired and let go, she continued supporting Darnell. She would still write him letters back to back. They would talk on the phone for hours. So even though she lost her job, she was still 
contacting this inmate. It's insane because normally you'd be arrested for that because that's like a breach of contract, a breach of morality, but they didn't press any charges against Tina. They just fired her and that was it. And so they just kept up their flirtation and you know she kept on sending him nudes and all this stuff. And eventually Tina started visiting him in a prison. Can you believe it? The same prison that she was fired from, she was visiting Darnell at once a week. So she kept this up for two years and two years later, Darnell was finally released from prison and he spent time at a halfway house with other parolees. And of course, she spent every waking moment with him. She'd be at the halfway house. She'd take him on job searches. It's like she was so infatuated with Darnell. And she told her family that, you know, even after all these years apart, she was very much in love with him. And now that he was free, they were going to get married and just, you know, live happily ever after. So she thought. Now, it was very clear in a lot of her letters that she wrote to Darnell that she would do anything for Darnell and that she really loved him. People run a lot of game in prison, but the true testament is once they get out. And once Darnell got out, he basically became very abusive towards Tina. He didn't appreciate all the stuff that she did for him in prison, you know, bringing him drugs, um, putting her life on the line, putting her career on the line, sleeping with him. He didn't appreciate any of that. He became very, very abusive and controlling over Tina, not only after he got out of prison, but after he stopped going to the halfway house. Now, while he was in prison, Tina was the one who kind of had authority over him. She kind of, for the most part, low-key ran the relationship because he was in a cell. But once he came out, Darnell definitely let her know who was boss. He let her know that he was the man of the relationship and that he was running shit. Darnell would often lash out at her. He would, you know, just be very violent towards her. If he suspected that Tina was even talking to anybody, flirting with another man, Darnell got insanely jealous. He wanted Tina to be his sole property. He didn't want Tina flirting with anybody else, talking to anybody else. So, you know, Darnell, after a while, made Tina's life a living hell. So at the time, Tina was working at a gas station, and Bobby, who himself was a ladies' man, you know what I'm saying? Bobby was very flirtatious. He was very handsome. And so he used to go to this gas station all the time, and Tina was one of the cashiers there. And, then, you know, they're all about the same age. So, you know, Bobby would flirt with her and Tina would be gassed up. You know what I'm saying? She'd be, you know, twirling her hair and batting her eyelashes and stuff, you know, and just flirting back with Bobby because he was attractive. She was attractive. So there was definitely some chemistry there. So at the time, they were both kind of feeling each other. Um, you know, Bobby didn't realize that she had a man or anything like that, but she overheard Bobby saying that he had some rims that he was trying to sell. He had this like fully custom Monte Carlo. And so he wanted to sell the rims. And so Tina knew that her boyfriend, um, Darnell was looking for some rims for his car. So at the time Tina was like, okay, well, I know somebody who needs some rims I can connect you to. Um, so yeah, let, let's make it happen. So Bobby was like, okay, cool. Cause he's trying to get these rims sold. It was like a few days later, they ended up meeting with Bobby and it was Darnell and Tina at the time, they go to go meet with Bobby to go sell um, Darnell the rims. And the whole time, you know, Bobby's still being flirty with her, you know what I'm saying? Because that's how they always joke. They always flirted at the job. And Bobby wasn't really sure if Darnell was Tina's man or not. And he really didn't care, you know what I'm saying? Because Bobby was that guy. So he really didn't care. Darnell seemed like he was okay, like he didn't mind. He was just there to look at the rims. But what he didn't realize that Darnell was seething with anger and jealousy. And he was just watching this whole display of Tina even entertaining this guy who's flirting with her. And so at that point in time, Darnell decided in his mind that this little pretty boy needed to be taught a lesson. So the official night of the murder was July 5th, 2021. And like I told you at the beginning of the story, the Taste of Minnesota went on from the 1st of July through the 4th. So that is when we had seen him. It was sometime within that date. On July 5th, the day after the 4th, um, Tina was visiting with one of her girlfriends. And once again, she was complaining about all the abuse that Darnell was putting her through. And she was just kind of tired of it. And um, Darnell, the day before, had took her car keys, wouldn't let her go out for the 4th of July and celebrate with her friends. And he basically ordered her to stay locked in the bedroom the whole time. Because like I said, the 4th of July, the whole four days in July in Minnesota is a big deal. 
everybody's at the taste. Everybody's there kicking it, having a good time. Well, Tina wasn't allowed to go. She had to sit her ass in the house, you know, per Darnell. She was ranting to her friend about this. She was really upset. She also said later on that Darnell had beat her with an alarm clock. And he had beat her so bad that, you know, she was drawing blood and things like that. So that is why she just stayed at the house and she was just really sad. And so one of the things that Darnell would do to keep Tina in check was go through her phone. Now, mind you, Darnell had gotten these rims already from Bobby. And so he looks through Tina's phone and he's seen phone calls from Bobby. So he's like, hold up. Why the fuck is this dude still calling you when we got the rims? What is this about? So at that point, he starts beating Tina with this alarm clock because he's really upset. And Tina's like, it's nothing. You know, he was just calling. Um, it's not no big deal. So then at that point, Bobby calls again. Because remember, he doesn't really know their relationship dynamic like that. He just sees a pretty girl and he's flirting with her. She's not telling Bobby, you know, this man is my guy. He's crazy. She's not telling Bobby shit. She's also entertaining the flirting that Bobby is doing. So Bobby's calling her phone. And so at that point, Darnell tells her to answer it. And he starts telling Tina what to say. So basically, the reason why Bobby was calling this time, it wasn't necessarily to flirt with her. He was calling to see if he could come pick up his tools because he had put the rims on Darnell's car, but all of the tools were left at Darnell's and he was going to come get them at a later time. He couldn't take them with him at that time. So he wanted to know if he could come and pick them up. So basically, Darnell sat on the bed behind Tina and told her to tell Bobby yes, and to also tell Bobby that it was her home and that Darnell did not live there. Now, what's interesting is that there was a young lady there named Katrina Valley. Katrina Valley is Ramon Smith, who is Darnell Smith and Shaka Smith's brother. That is his girlfriend. And they were there at the house earlier. And so she was there to witness Darnell basically tell Tina what to say to Bobby, to who she assumed was Bobby at the time on the phone. And Darnell was whispering in Tina's ear. And so she witnessed that. And it's like her and Ramon felt like something was off because after she got off the phone with Bobby, Darnell was like, that's it. We're about to set him up. We're about to whoop his ass. Ramon, you're about to help. And at that point, Ramon was like, no, uh, it doesn't feel good right now. You know, she's going through it. She has a headache. I got to get her home. And Ramon in the valley, they bolt out of there. They run, you know what I'm saying? They run and don't look back because they knew something was about to go down bad and they didn't want to be a part of it. So what ended up happening is that Darnell called his other brother, Shaka Smith, to come to the house to help him beat up Bobby Holder. So, you know, Shaka, they're all scared of Darnell. Darnell is like the crazy brother. So Shaka is like, okay, fine. You know, I'll come over there. We're just going to jump him and that's it. So he tells Shaka to basically hide in the bathroom with him. And so Darnell and Shaka are hiding in the bathroom. Meanwhile, Tina Leia is going to the door and she's greeting Bobby. And she's like, you know, hey, you know, the stuff is right here. You can pick it up. So Darnell basically had a police flashlight and he also had a gun in his waistband. And so while they're hiding in the bathroom, Darnell tells Shaka, go outside and make sure that there's nobody with Bobby. Make sure that there's nobody in the car waiting for him. Make sure that he's by himself. So Shaka goes outside to make sure that the coast is clear. And he comes back into the house, but he doesn't see Darnell in the bathroom. So Shaka starts heading towards the bedroom. He's creeping to the bedroom and he's seeing Darnell in front of the bedroom door. And Darnell is holding the police flashlight above his head. And he's creeping up on Bobby, who's in the bedroom, but his back is towards the door. So Bobby has no idea what's about to happen. All of a sudden, Darnell pushes open the door. He takes the flashlight and he just strikes Bobby on the head. And Bobby falls. So now Shaka is hearing this loud thud. And he's seeing Bobby and Darnell, now they're fighting. They're struggling on the floor. Bobby's trying to get out of there. Bobby's trying to run out. So all of a sudden, they're running around the living room. And Bobby's like, you know, what is going on? I didn't do anything. I don't even know y'all like that. Please, you know, what is going on? What did I do? So then Bobby tries to flee out of their apartment. But Shaka is blocking the door. And Bobby's unable to push Shaka out the way because he's just been beating the head. So he's kind of disoriented. All of a sudden, Darnell pulls a gun out his waistband and he shoots Bobby Holder in the lower back. 
At that point, Bobby falls to the floor and he's literally crying and he's saying, please, just let me go to the hospital. I don't know you. If I get questioned, I'll say, I don't know you guys. Please just let me go. I don't know what I did wrong. And then Darnell responds, you're not going anywhere. After that, Darnell drug Bobby back into the bedroom where he proceeded to keep assaulting him. At that point, Shaka was ready to go. Shaka was okay with jumping Bobby and beating him, but he did not sign up for this whole gun situation. He had no idea that Darnell was planning on shooting Bobby and killing him. He just thought they were just gonna jump him. That's what he was told. So he goes to leave and Darnell basically tells him, no, you're not leaving anywhere. You're going to be here with me. You're a part of this now. You can't go. So now Shaka is just standing in the bedroom doorway. Tina is also on the bed watching this. And so Shaka sees Darnell take his gun. He points the gun at Bobby Holder's face and he pulls the trigger, but the gun does not fire. So nothing happens and Darnell is shocked like, what is going on? Why is this not firing? So then Darnell goes into the chamber. He fixes the round. He puts the gun to Bobby Holder's shoulder blade where there's like a main artery right there. He puts it to that shoulder blade and then he pulls the trigger again. And this time the gun goes off and it kills Bobby Holder. So once Bobby's dead, he then drags him from the bedroom back to the living room and he goes through Bobby's pockets. He took out Bobby's cash, he took his car keys, he also took a small bag of marijuana from Bobby as well. He gave Shaka the cell phone, the weed, and the car keys, but he kept the cash for himself. Now if that's not crazy enough, this part is really, really disturbing. Um, Darnell also found a pocket knife that was in Bobby's pocket. So he then takes the pocket knife and he starts stripping Bobby's body. He starts cutting off his clothes and now Bobby is laying on the living room floor, basically naked. And at that point, Darnell takes the pocket knife, he grabs Bobby's genital areas and he chops it off to prove a point to Tina Leia about if she tries to cheat or leave for another man, that's what he's gonna do to anybody she calls herself trying to flirt with. That is just some of the most disturbing, evil, despicable things that you could do to a body. But he wasn't done there. He then told Shaka that he needed to help him, you know, clean up this whole murder scene. But first, Shaka needed to drive Bobby's car to another location because he didn't want them finding Bobby's car anywhere near his home. At that point, Shaka took Bobby's car to Woodbury. He drove it all the way from St. Paul to Woodbury and he dropped the car off in somebody's apartment complex. And then he ended up just catching a ride to his own home. And the next morning, very, very early in the morning, like around seven o'clock, Shaka starts receiving phone calls from Darnell. And Darnell is telling him, you need to come back here. You need to help me with this body. You need to help me clean up this mess. You were just as involved as I was. And he's like, if you don't come back here, you're gonna be done just like I did Bobby. So now Shaka is scared for his life. He literally watched this man not only shoot Bobby in cold blood, but then chop off his genital areas. So now Shaka is scared that the same thing might happen to him. So he ends up returning back to Darnell's house. And so they're in the basement and they're down there with Bobby's body. And basically Shaka said during the trial that Darnell had intended to bury the body, but because the basement floor was cemented, it was very hard to dig down there without like a power jack or some type of really big power tool. And that would have made too much noise. So at that point, Darnell decided it was better if they just dismembered the body. So now Darnell is basically just chopping up Bobby's body. He's cutting up his arms, his legs. He's just cutting everything up any old type of way. And he proceeds to then chop off Bobby's head. At the point that he was chopping up Bobby's head, Shaka could no longer take it. He started vomiting and he ran upstairs. He couldn't handle the gruesome sight that he was seeing before his eyes. He could not believe that his own brother was capable of something so evil. Another disturbing thing that Shaka testified during the court um, proceedings is that while Darnell was chopping off Bobby's arm, he also chopped off his hand. And then he took Bobby's hand and he shook his hand and said to Bobby, hey, how are you doing, sir? H how do you feel today? 
Like if that, this is like the things that like nightmares are made of. That is so disturbing. Not only is he desecrating and dismembering a, a human being, a body, he's then playing around with the arm and the hand and, you know, shaking the hand. Like this dude is just demented. There's no other way to describe this. There's no other words to describe this behavior. He is demented and he is really sick and he's really evil. So after the whole arm shaking thing, Darnell then decided to carve blood's rule on Bobby Holder's back. And again, the reason why he did that, he wanted to make it look like it was a gang affiliated murder. But the Minneapolis gang unit knew that it wasn't, it made no sense because that's really not how gangs move. They're not dismembering bodies and writing blood's rule. But that was his thought process for doing that to make it look like, you know, Bobby Holder was gang affiliated, you know, that maybe he was a Crip or a GD and then the Bloods did it because remember Darnell was one of the leaders at the time of the Gangster Disciples so that's why he specifically went out his way to blame the Bloods who were one of the GD's rivals at the time in the Twin Cities. Darnell also tried to remove the tattoos but he was unsuccessful for whatever reason he was unable to like you know chop off the tattoos off of Bobby's skin um, but he did try to remove the tattoos after he cut up all these body parts, he then placed everything in a cooler with a plastic bag and then he put a bed sheet on top of the cooler. So after he did that, Shaka could take no more. Shaka's upstairs puking, he's crying, he's going through it. Shaka ends up leaving. He's like, F this, I'm out. So he ends up just leaving. And so now Darnell has a neighbor upstairs and that neighbor's name is Andre Parker. So Andre Parker was outside minding his business, smoking on a cigarette. And he had known Darnell for some time. They had always been cordial. And so Darnell at this point, he's upset because Shaka has left him. You know, Shaka's not answering his phone calls. And Darnell feels like I have to get this body out of my house. His body's been here for like 24 hours. The basement stinks. I need to get rid of this body. So he goes up to Andre Parker and basically says, I need to show you something. And Andre's like, well, what do you want to show me? He's like, come to my house, come in the basement. I have to show you something. I need your help with something. Andre ends up, you know, flicking his cigarette and he goes down in the basement with Darnell and Darnell removes the bed sheets and opens up the cooler. And Andre is just horrified. He's looking in this cooler and he's literally seeing body parts. He's seeing legs and arms and hands and a head. And he's just like, what the fuck is going on here? And Darnell then pulls out his gun and basically tells Andre, you're involved now. You're going to help me dispose of this body. You're going to take Tina far, far away and y'all are going to dispose of this body. And you better not say anything. If you do, I'm going to kill you too. And that's proof of it. I already killed somebody and dismembered them. If you play with me, you're going to end up in the same situation. So now Andre is scared for his life. Imagine you're just a neighbor. You're minding your business. You're outside smoking on a cigarette, you know, about to get ready to go for work. And your neighbor asks for your help. You're thinking he might want help with moving furniture or putting up a picture. Oh, no, not this fucking crazy ass neighbor. He wants you to help, you know, dispose of a body that he just dismembered. So at that point, Andre's between a rock and a hard shell. He's like, I don't know what to do. I don't want him to kill me. Obviously, he's a killer because there's a body in a cooler. So Andre decides to just do what Darnell says. Because again, Darnell is a really scary character and he's also a gang leader. And most people know like Darnell is not one to play with. In the meantime, you know, Andre is now curious. Like, you got me involved in this fucking murder. Who is this person? And so at that point, Darnell tells him that, you know, oh, it's just some 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 dude. You know, he tried to call himself robbing me. I don't play that shit. You're never going to rob me and think you're going to get away with it. I had to teach him a lesson. So now Andre's like, okay, well, maybe the person deserved it. I don't know. I just don't want to end up in the cooler. They just get in the car and they start driving. And so Andre's like petrified. He's in the car with this killer and this, you know, idiot girlfriend and the whole time they're in the car tina's driving and she's just crying she's literally crying the entire time and andre's just thinking to himself what the hell have i got myself into so now they're driving all around the twin cities they're driving all around saint paul they even drove to some parts of minneapolis and they could not find a decent enough spot to basically dispose of bobby holder's body 
every park that they try to go to to basically dump his body, there were too many people at the parks. Because remember, again, this is around July. So in the Twin Cities, people are out and about because we're stuck in the house through most of the winter. So when it's summertime, people are at the parks, people are going to festivals. It's a lot to do. So because of the time of year it was, they couldn't find anywhere secluded enough or quiet enough where they could dispose of the body. So after, you know, tossing out some of the body parts, they ended up getting back in the car and they drive back to the house. So now at this point, Darnell's tired. He's exhausted from, you know, killing and dismembering somebody. And he's just, you know, he doesn't want to be bothered anymore with this situation. So now he tells Andre to help him take the remains out of his car and put them in Tina's car and that Andre should just drive with Tina to go find a place to dispose of the body and that most likely they should just go somewhere to, you know, go towards Wisconsin, go on these back roads, but they have to dispose of this body and if they come back with the body, um, he's going to hurt the both of them. So now the only place that Tina can think of going is to her hometown in Wisconsin, which is a very small rural town. So they end up driving all the way out there. They get there and they start digging this shallow grave. And at that point, they bury the torso. There's still, you know, a few remaining pieces left. So they end up finding like an unpaved road. They go down that road and they just basically dump the rest of Bobby Holder's body. So this young man's body was scattered all through Minnesota and Wisconsin. It's so heartbreaking to just hear this. So it was just, you know, scattered through densely wooded areas. The torso was buried on a farm. Um, his head was just thrown out wherever. So they basically were just trying to get rid of this body any way that they could. Now, you remember I talked about Ramon earlier, how he wanted to meet with the police and he was like super scared and nervous. Now, Ramon came back and he basically wanted to testify, but he wanted immunity, which he was granted because he was not involved in the murder. And he testified that him and Catherine were there and that they overheard them luring Bobby to the house. He also testified that he spoke to his brother Darnell and he asked Darnell, like, you know, what happened after me and Catherine left? You know, did the guy ever come over? Did y'all beat him up? What happened? And basically, Darnell admitted to Ramon Smith that he first pointed the gun at Bobby Holder's head and that it didn't go off. So then he fixed, you know, he re-racked the gun and then he pointed it at a major artery in his shoulder and then he shot him in the shoulder. He also admitted to shooting Bobby in the hip and shooting him right around the kidney area to make sure that he was dead. Darnell also told his brother Ramon that as Holder fell to the ground, you know, he was crying, he was begging for his life. He was saying that he wouldn't tell anybody what happened. And he said that he knelt next to Bobby and just laughed in his face and ridiculed him as he watched Bobby just flop around and, you know, try to fight for his life. He sat there and just laughed because he thought it was funny. He then proceeded to tell Ramon that he initially wanted to bury Bobby in the basement, but but he couldn't because of the concrete in the basement. And so they decided to dismember his body and just scatter him throughout Wisconsin and Minnesota. So at this point, Ramon is just sick to his stomach hearing this because just like Shaka, he just assumed that they were just gonna beat him up and then go on about their business. But to find out that not only did he lure Bobby to the home, but that he killed him and then he dismembered him, it was almost too much for Ramon to bear. Darnell then told Ramon that he was gonna be leaving town and not coming back. And he felt like the police were onto Shaka because at that point, the police had been calling Shaka's phone because that was the phone number that they had seen attached to Bobby's call list. And they kept figuring out if Bobby is dead and missing, how is he calling Shaka? So Darnell felt like the police were closing in on Shaka. So he was gonna get out of town before they could capture both of them. So once he told Ramon that, that is when Ramon contacted the police and wanted to share his story of what he knew to the police. Now, another one of Darnell's friends, it seemed like Darnell couldn't hold water to save his life. So he's definitely going around town bragging about this murder. So he had another friend named Maynard Cross. And basically he was an acquaintance of Darnell. And he testified during the trial that Darnell was basically bragging to him and the gang about how he killed this man who was attempting to rob him and that he chopped up his body and he basically, you know, threw his body in the woods and that the police would never find him again. And so when this news came out of this torso being found with a tattoo, 
um, that made Maynard want to come forward as well and tell the police what he knew about the situation. He also testified that the day of the killing, he was hanging with Darnell as he was bragging. And he said that when he went to Darnell's home, he definitely saw blood on the floors. He saw some blood on the walls. And you could tell that this was fresh blood. It wasn't blood that was like super old. You can tell that something had taken place in that house and that Darnell missed some spots while he was trying to clean up the murder scene. So at this point, the police had heard Ramon's story. They were able to connect all of the dots between Tina, Darnell, and Bobby. But now at this point, Tina and Darnell have gone on the run because they know that the police are closing in on them. So they got up out of town. But the police were able to arrest Shaka and Andre and both of them confessed to their parts in the murder. And one thing that both men said was that Darnell was incredibly manipulative and he was extremely dangerous and that the police needed to find him right away before more people got hurt. Now Shaka told the police that he had thrown up several times while being forced to help Darnell and watch Darnell dismember Bobby's body. He attempted many times to back out but Darnell kept threatening him with the gun and kept saying if you leave here and you don't help me with this you're going to end up just like Bobby and Shaka you know who was a young brother to Darnell was scared you know it's obvious his older brother is crazy as hell so he was scared to like you you know, buck up to him or say that he wasn't going to help out. So about a month after the murder, the police were able to track down Tina Alea and Darnell Smith to a small apartment complex in Glendora, Mississippi. So that is where they ran off to and they were eventually arrested and had to face trial. Now, after being taken into custody, Darnell seemed extremely cold. He literally had no empathy, no sympathy. He just didn't care. He, he lacked all human emotion. And as for Tina, she kept trying to play dumb. She was trying to play victim. She was getting her whole Karen on at this point. Now, Darnell's trial and sentence was in March of 2002. He was being charged with first degree murder. And people who were there at the sentencing said Darnell was just very vicious. He seemed like a cauldron of boiling water. He showed very little remorse, very little lack of emotion. He was very nasty. You could just tell like he just had this super rage boiling inside of him. He even had the nerve to yell to Bobby Holder's mother and say, I'll send you his head on Halloween. That is what he said to Bobby Holder's mother during the proceeding. On top of that, Darnell also threatened to kill the prosecutors. One of the prosecutors, his name was Jim Keeler, and he basically said that Darnell was one of the scariest people that he's ever had to prosecute. Darnell's defense for doing all this is he claimed that Bobby was coming to his house to steal his rooms back that he paid for. But the prosecutors were able to prove that Darnell's violent, jealous behavior was what was truly to blame for this murder. He was jealous of Bobby. You know, Bobby had a so-called quote unquote easy life. He was fun, he was lighthearted. You know, people just drew to him like a moth. And he was just a really nice guy, very handsome. And he could see that his girlfriend, Tina, was definitely taking a liking to Bobby. And honestly, Bobby's probably the type of guy that Tina's family would have wanted Tina to be with. Somebody who was hardworking, who was, he didn't have a criminal record. He was a good father, a good son. That was more of Tina's speed. And Darnell knew that. Darnell knew that Tina wasn't really about that life and that her family would never accept him. So it just made him more and more jealous that she was vibing with this guy who was definitely more her type. So thanks to his two brothers, Shaka and Ramon, testifying against Darnell, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now during Tina's trial, of course she played Karen, she played victim, and she claimed that the only reason why she called Bobby over is because she really thought that Darnell was just gonna beat him up, and that you know she didn't really wanna argue and go back and forth with Darnell because Darnell was always putting hands on her. And she just testified that she was just really scared of Darnell. He had manipulated her, everything from her knowing him in prison and how she you know lost her job behind him. And then now he manipulated her into calling Bobby Holder to the house only to watch him murder Bobby as opposed to beating him up. And because she was so scared of what he might do to her, she had no choice but to cooperate in helping to dispose of his body and bury his torso on her father's farm. Now she had every opportunity to come forward. She had every opportunity to call the police. After all, Ramon came forward. You know, even Shaka was honest about what happened. Andre eventually came forward, but Tina never one time came forward. Tina instead chose to go on the run with Darnell and hide out with him in Mississippi for a month. So to me, you can't be too scared of him. 
Okay, at any point in time, she could have left and not came back, but she chose to go on the run with him on some Bonnie and Clyde type shit, okay? So because of that, the jury was not buying her crocodile tears. They were not here for it. And they sentenced Tina Lea to 17 and a half years in prison. However, after only seven years, Tina won an appeal and she was released under supervision in 2009. Since her arrest and imprisonment, her and Darnell have not spoken to each other. Tina is currently free. She lives in the Twin Cities, child, somewhere. Um, but yeah, she got out back in 2009. Some people say that she's since changed her name, but she definitely still stays in the Twin Cities. As far as Shaka Smith and Andre Parker, Shaka cut a deal for his testimony against Darnell, and he was sentenced to 22 years in prison for second degree felony murder. Andre Parker was sentenced to five years in prison um, for aiding and abetting after the fact. So he still got time, you know, and it's really sad because like I said, Andre literally had nothing to do with this situation, but was kind of forced into it, but he still got five years. So the whole situation is incredibly sad. Three years after the murder of Bobby Holder, his deer hunters were out and about and they found a human skull and they ended up turning the skull into the police and that skull was none other than Bobby Holder's skull and that skull was found three years after his murder so once they found the skull Bobby Holder's mother she decided to hold a memorial for Bobby but unfortunately for her his arms legs and the rest of his body parts um, outside of his torso have never been found I think the saddest part with all this is that Darnell Smith has kind of become like this hood legend in the streets of the Twin Cities and in the prison system. People still talk about Darnell. They still talk about this murder to this day. Darnell has been featured on a lot of documentaries throughout the years. He's been on a lot of A&E shows, any type of prison show that has to do with Minnesota, because he's been locked up at Oak Park Heights. He's been locked up at Moose Lake. You know, quite a few prisons out here he's been locked up at. And anytime they've had cameras in the prison, He's always been featured. He's even had bloggers, you know what I'm saying, go to the prison to visit him and take pictures and, you know, blog about his life in prison. It's something about Darnell. It's something about his energy, his spirit that also brings people to him because people, after all these years, they're still enamored by him. But I know for me personally, anytime I would see him come on television, anytime I would see him on TV, I would just get goosebumps. I would just get the creeps because I always think like, this is the man who not only killed Bobby, but dismembered him. And he's now on A&E, he's on television. He's like, you know, living some type of weird fame from this. It's just really strange. And I think the saddest part of this is that that was my first and last time meeting Bobby, but I've never forgotten it all these years. And I think, you know, what's really incredibly sad about this situation is that when we were all there at the Taste of Minnesota as these young, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds, we would have never thought that this young man that was right here in front of us would have been brutally murdered in the manner in which he was. So this concludes the story of Bobby Holder, Darnell Smith, and Tina Lea. I think this story is incredibly sad, and it's one of those stories that still haunt me to this day. But I think what I can take away from this story is that jealousy is a very complex emotion, and people need to understand that emotion, and they need to be able to rein that in. If not, jealousy can drive you to do some just crazy, evil, wicked things. Jealousy can strike people of any age, any social status, and jealousy becomes aroused in people when they see others as competition, when they see others as being better than them. So I think one of the lessons that we can take from this story is that if you're feeling jealous in any way, recognize that feeling and handle it as soon as possible. Don't let jealousy, suspicion, and rage lead you into being another Darnell Smith and taking a beloved person from their family member. All because of simple jealousy. That is what this murder boiled down to. Bobby didn't steal anything from him. Bobby never slept with his girlfriend. He literally flirted with Tina and Darnell couldn't handle it. So thank you all so much for taking time out to tune into True Crime Tea Time. Stay safe and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.